It's good to see you guys today. I'm glad for all of you that are in the house this morning. If you have your Bible, turn to Genesis, 20, uh, Genesis chapter 32. And today, my message should be intentionally uncomfortable. So if you're in this place and you have never been here before, this is your very first time with us, I welcome you, I celebrate you, I honor you. I'm not trying to point you out, make you do backflips and all that kind of stuff. We just want to say we're grateful that you are with us in the place this morning. But if they didn't tell you anything about me before you came, um, not every Sunday you come will there be a message that makes you feel comfortable. Uh, because the fact is, one thing I've learned is all of us in this place that are over the, well, all of us that are breathing have some areas in our lives that need to change. Y'all are quiet up in this place already. Listen, if I say something good or at least not lying, please talk back to me. Say amen, say what's up, say something. Uh, don't just sit there like you're plotting or planning something against me. It makes me nervous. Like, I have kids, right? And I know y'all's house and your kids, is, is everything is good. But in my house, if it's quiet, that's a danger zone. In my house, if it's completely quiet, somebody's up to something. I got, I got kids and boxers. You, if there is not something breaking in your house or noise in your house, that means something's going on, planning or plotting something. So quiet church scares me. I like people to talk to me. It will not hurt my feelings, I promise you. But today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a few, a few moments today. I'm going to hit some things that's going, that should make us uncomfortable. A per, you realize a person that will never challenge you can never change you? You realize that, right? And God bless you. I love you. I'm so glad that you're here this morning looking all amazing with your fresh Chanel on. Some of you got your, got your clothes just right. Some of you got your tracks on just right. You could shout and your hair wouldn't go sideways. Some of you are just got, you got it all where it needs to be. But at the end of the day, you better understand something. Up in here, I didn't come just to make friends. I believe God has a plan and a purpose for your life that before your mom and dad ever snuck out, did the giddy up, did the wobble, did, well, I don't know how your parents met. Before any of that went down, God had his hand on your life. He has a plan for you and a purpose. Some of you have been through so much hell in your life, you owe it to yourself to figure out why you've been through what you've been through. It hasn't been for no reason. There's been a reason you've walked through the stuff you've walked through. There's been a reason some of you went through some fire and come out not even smelling like smoke. There's some reason some of you are supposed to have already quit in life and you're still here, still making it, still surviving. You better fight to figure it out. You better fight the, the, the weak in you and the sissy in you and find out what it is that God wants to do in your life. Life. Amen? Amen? So we're going to talk this morning. Look at your neighbor. Make sure they're awake. Make sure they're alive and ready to go. They only going to have me for 40 more minutes. Tell them 40 more minutes. Hold on. Less than young and the restless. That's all you got to survive today. And you're going to be out. Look at your neighbor. Take them to church and tell them to say, neighbor, don't judge my limp. This morning I'm going to talk to you on the idea of don't judge my limp. This morning I want to talk to the person that's in this place this morning that knows what it's like to feel like your life is under attack and you're in opposition. Today I come for somebody who realizes that sometimes in life, even though I'm smiling and acting like everything is cool, things aren't rosy. I want to talk to somebody this morning that knows what it's like to be in a battle and feel like if it's up to you, you might just quit. Today I come for the quit in you, and I really today, to be honest with you, today's message is entirely designed for you to look in the mirror at you. I like to preach about your neighbor. I like to talk about your cousins and all them, Pookie, Ray Ray, Buckshot, Jim Bob, Juanito. We got all of that in this church. I, I love to talk about them, but today I come to talk about you, and I come to preach about me. And the truth is I preached about me so good the first service in Frederick. Right now it might be more about you. Me and Jesus already had a, t a moment this morning. He done, he done gave me the hookup. So this morning I might be preaching just at you. Uh, don't judge my limp. Let's get into this word this morning. If you have your Bible, I told you Genesis chapter 32, correct? Okay. Let me explain something to you. Do you realize that any time major opposition arises in your life, it's a sign that God is planning some kind of movement or promotion or breakthrough? Many times we don't step into the greatness locked up on the inside of us because we're scared to deal with the giants that's standing right there in, our, in front of our face. Now, I like to throw pop reference, cult, cultural references out there from time to time, but I'm going to take it back a few years, about 10 years or so, to a movie 
that I like, and every time I see it on TV, I'm not going to lie, I stop and I watch it. It's uh, The main character is a gentleman by the name of Brad Pitt. And in this movie, and then, what? <laughs> I would say everyone stretch your hands this way, but I don't even know if it's going to help. Uh, <laughs> but th this is the, people say Brad Pitt was in No, this is the movie Brad Pitt was in. I don't care about all the other ones. This is the movie. In this movie, he is recreating a character, a famous character of, of Homer, uh, that his name is Achilles. And in this movie, it's called Troy. At the beginning of the movie, Achilles is a warrior, and he's a, a leader uh, of men within the Greek army. And during uh, ancient times, many, very often when a battle was to be fought, some battles would be, would, the outcome would be decided by, the, by single man-to-man -man combat by those chosen as champions. And at the beginning of this movie, Brad Pitt's laying there all hemmed up, drunk, drunk off of his life with a couple chicks and all kinds of stuff that's going on. And this young man comes up, wakes him up, and tells him, we need you at the battle. The battle started. So Brad Pitt's getting all dressed, gets his stuff on. He goes out and gets on the horse. And the little guy walks up to him and he goes, if I was you, I wouldn't want to fight the Spartan that you're facing. He's the biggest man I've ever seen. And Brad Pitt said, that's why no one will remember your name. Yeah, because see, people are remembered by the giants they slay. Some people like to talk to you about the giants in your life as if the giant is there to provoke you, but it's really there to promote you. But what do you do when the greatest giant in your life that needs to be dealt with to move you to another level is the one that stares at you every morning when you get up? Oh, we're going to talk today. Don't, don't judge my limp, though, because we're going to get into it. Opposition is a sign that promotion is possible. The enemy is not happy because there are people in this place this morning that your life is positioned right now for a mighty shift, a change, and I hate to be churchy on you, but use a churchy term, breakthrough. I believe that God wants to do something amazing in your life, and it's at the time of our greatest battles that we get the, 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 our greatest enemies. And we understand at Destination Church that we do have opposition in the spirit realm as well. There is an enemy. If not, the Bible wouldn't say to be sober and be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, goes about... As a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. There is a real enemy that's out to devour. He's out to get you off track. He's out to ruin your life. But we also understand that for the believer, the enemy is a defeated foe. So the only way the enemy wins in my life is if I is in areas of my life where I'm ignorant, because the Bible says that the enemy has right to trample in areas of darkness. Darkness not meaning the absence of light, but the absence of revelation. What are you saying, Pastor Sean? What you don't know could be killing you. But we also understand that we have a real enemy. He wants to destroy your life. He wants to wreck you. He wants to cause you to do all kinds of things to get you off a of track. But here's the thing. The greatest enemy we'll ever face is not the devil. It's us. You, I am the biggest problem Sean Coley will ever deal with. Me. Not my mama, not my cousin and them. Me. Not just what's happened to me, but how I respond to what's happened to me in life can dictate where I'm going and who I'm going to be. So this morning, it is about quarter till. Give me 25 minutes to work this thing out. Where we t uh, Fred's watching the clock, so if I'm off, Fred's going to let you guys know. This morning I come to talk to you about our greatest problem, which is the inner me. And it's the me many times I'm not willing to deal with. This morning I come to deal with us internally. Genesis 32, starting at verse 22. Let's read 22 through 32. Are you ready? And you guys forgive me, I was rushing out this morning trying to get to Frederick and I forgot my Bible so I have to cheat. And he arose that night and took his two wives and two female servants and his eleven sons and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook and sent them over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip 
and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint, and he wrestled with him. But he said, let me go, for the day breaks. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask me about my name? I'm not the one that needs to know who they are because I am who I am. Anyway, it's just for those that are listening. And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Peniel, the sun rose on him and he limped on his hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip and the muscle that shrank. Don't judge my limp. Don't judge me if you don't really know me, if you don't know my story. We'll talk about Jacob for a minute. Jacob was a trick. He was a trickster. He was... His name literally meant a heel grabber. Jacob, let me, I'll get back to my message in a second. Let me break this down for you, not assuming everyone's been to Sunday school. Jacob was a young man who was born a twin. He was born the second son. The reason he was called heel grabber is because when Jacob was being pushed out of the loins of his mother, when Esau came out, Jacob had his hand on Esau's foot and was grabbing him. Jacob's name meant a trick, a trickster, a heel grabber, a supplanter. Jacob was somebody that all of his life wanted a position that wasn't his by birthright, the position of the firstborn. That might not mean much in our culture, but in this culture it meant a lot. Because when the firstborn son passed the blessing and the inheritance from the father, the father, the father declared blessing upon the firstborn son. So as Jacob and Esau's father started to get old, he favored his oldest son more than Jacob. He favored Esau. Esau was a man's man out in the fields, working, fighting, hunting, all that kind of stuff. Jacob was a mama's boy. He stayed at home with mama all the time. He liked to hang out and do the cooking and all that kind of stuff. They had to have their favorites, and that's who he ran with. And as his father was getting old and he could no longer see, he called Esau to him and he said, my son, I'm about to die. I'm about to pass on the birthright to you. Before I die, go out and cook me some wild, find me some wild game. Before I die, I need something wild. The father loves wild game. That's another sermon for another day. But if you want to think about it for a second, that's why we praise the way that we do at Destination Church. Because our Father loves wild game. He doesn't like tame and, and calm and just average church. He, God is not afraid to live where the wild things are. You know, That's why some of us praise the way we do at church. Because we know the Bible tells us to lift up all your hands. To shout unto God with a voice of triumph. To make known his great name. We, we do this because we know our, yeah, it's crazy. They wild up in there where our father likes wild game. But while Esau was out in the field, Jacob went before his father. Jacob's mother told him, hey son, I heard your dad's about to give the birthright away. It should go to you because you're my favorite. Here's what I want you to do. Go out and kill a goat. Put its fur on you. Go into your father because he can't see very well. I'll cook the meal the way he likes it. You'll take it into him and pretend you're his brother and you'll get him to bless you. So Jacob takes a meal in, the, the meal that it looks like it's in the original meal, but it's not really an original meal because anybody that's ever ate goat, especially to all my Jamaican family that's had some oil to rank goat, goat is gamey. Goat tastes wild. 
So you can take something that's been domesticated and make it look wild and fool people without proper vision. I ain't got time to hit that. It's the problem with the church in America today is we got a form of godliness that looks like Jesus, sounds like Jesus. We even want to make it look wild with some lights and some fog machines and some whatever, but there's no real anointing on it because it's not really wild game. It's a substitute. <laughs> Topic for another day. And too many of our pastors like myself fight with, with being Jacob. You know Why? Because we allow what we perceive the mother wants. Let's consider the mother, the church, the place where we're birthed. We'll allow the church to dress us in the clothing we want to be dressed with that we've seen somebody else be blessed in because we don't think the Father loves us enough to bless us as ourselves. So we got way too many preachers preaching this morning going, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. When you're not Bishop Jakes. We don't need another Bishop Jakes. We don't need another Rod Parsley. We don't need another Stephen Furtick. We, God needs the first you. But what happens is guys like me dress up like somebody else that we've seen God bless, and we think if I could just act like them, God will bless me like them. I hope y'all are watching. And we fight this trickster spirit. Jacob got a blessing from the Father, but he got it illegally. Because he was a trick. How many times are we going to allow the trick in us to try to make us do things or want to do things to get what we want, but it's not what God has for us? I know there's not any tricks up in here this morning. But like I said, I done preached to me this morning. I come to talk to some of y'all. The problem is all of us have this thing on the inside of us. And see, some of you don't believe it. So before I'm done, I'm going to prove it to you. Before I'm done today, I promise you, I'm going to I'm going to lead you down a path where you're going to see some areas in your life that you know, okay, that's a life that's hindering me. You know why? Because I need to get the Jacob out of us. I need the Jacob out of me. I need it going. I want to be everything God wants me to be. And guess what? If I got to fight with God to get it, if I got to go through hell to get it, and after God touches me, I walk a little different. You can judge my limp if you want to, but you're not the one that changed my name. I know men called me Jacob. I know I was a trick. I know I was a deceiver. I know I was a heel grabber. But if I allow God to get me in a place called alone, y'all are quiet right now. Let me explain something to you. And Jacob was alone, and a man came to wrestle with him. It was not a man. This is a theophany. This is an appearance of Jesus Christ in the old covenant before he comes. Because anytime God puts on a flesh form and comes into earth, he comes as the form of Jesus Christ. Anytime. That's the, it, there's many appearances of God in the Old Covenant where he showed up in flesh form. That's, that's a theophany. He comes. He wrestles. That's why he asked Jacob, what's your name? He didn't ask him because he didn't know it. He asked him because he needed Jacob to locate himself. Who are you? Admit it. Admit, you, admit your mess, trick. That was probably too far. Forgive me. I got... We're going we to edit that out. If any of y'all Facebook and live right now, you need to change that. And if you're a guest here, I apologize. I'm sorry. First time, forgive me. It's y'all's fault. Too many people quiet not talking to me. I just start going in my own head. Y'all know my head goes places. I'm trying to go after the deceiver in me. The person lying to me. I'm trying to get rid of the person everyone else has labeled me. My daddy named me Jacob. I didn't ask to be named Jacob. There are things in your life that are hindering you and destroying you and messing with you. You didn't ask for. Somebody else named you. Y'all are, oh, we're going to talk, I promise. We're not there yet, so let me get to it quick because some of y'all are looking at me like you don't believe me. The fact is... Jacob was a person that could not seem to get out of his own way. And there are people in this place this morning that every time God has you to a place where he's just about to move you in the next, you start tapping the big self-destruct button you got taped on your chest. Can you stand to be blessed? Can you stand to change? Can you stand to be shifted? Can you stand to have God get what he wants to get out of your life? 
The fact is, freedom is harder to, listen, it's harder to manage than bondage. That's why we stay bound so easily. Because any time I walk in the freedom God has for me, now I'm responsible for the trajectory of where God's taking me as long as I keep him first. If I stay in bondage, I can just blame everybody else. Nobody held me. No one talked to me. My mama slapped me. My dad wasn't there. I can blame everyone else. The fact is I'm not minimizing those things. If you look down your row and you look at someone in the face over the age of seven, I can promise you something's happened to them. There is no one in this place that something bad has not happened. And I can tell you another thing. With your holy, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, talking in tongues, neighbor sitting beside you, they've done some grime too. If they hadn't, they wouldn't be at Destination Church. <laughs> Not hanging with some of y'all. Jesus. Tell the truth and shame the devil this morning. None of us are here perfect. We're just saved and loving Jesus. I'm growing. I'm moving. In the middle of all this narrative about Jacob, his family, his drama, everything going on, he encounters God in a wrestling match. And it wasn't until Jacob found himself in a place called alone that the ability to wrestle presented itself. That ought to be a sign for some of you in this place that don't understand why you've been through some of the things you've been through of late. Because God's trying to get you to a place where you are finally in, at the end of yourself and will finally listen to him. Because some of you, you're too important in your own world, in your own mind. What God wants to do in your future is too big for him to keep leaving you go the way you're going. So he'll allow life to hit you so hard that it knocks you back upside down ways, backwards and all over the place until you finally stop, get alone with God and say, okay, I'm ready to wrestle with this. I got to deal with me and you. The, if you're in this place and you love Jesus, the answer of the, listen, the answer to the question of lordship in your life will get answered one way or another. God is eventually going to deal with who's really going to be Lord, him or you. This is too hard for y'all. Some of y'all are looking at me sure. I'm, this is not powder puff enough. Let me make, try, to, I'm, let me try to rein it in. Many of us refuse to wrestle. We can't see what the enemy has done in our lives that has us in this place where we're still trying to fight in our own strength and our own ability. I'll go to church and get it right. I'll do this. I'll do that. No, no, it's not about you. It's about what God wants to do in your life. The fact is we are in a fight. John, uh, John chapter 15 bears out very plain that we have a fight, and that fight is, is, is we are in what's called the world system. And if you write those verses down, read them later. I want to read one more verse because my time is running quick, and I want to get into really what I want to talk about. 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. 1 John 2, 16 says this. I was giving you time. You see how I was just drawing that out? I only did that, y'all, because I skipped the verse I told him was next. I told y'all to write it down. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. You know, Satan is called the prince of this world. God will eventually reconcile this world to himself and deal with the enemy in finality, but until he does, the enemy wants to use three main avenues to get into your life and cause you to self-sabotage. Let me help you real quick, because I don't really talk and preach too much about sin, because the fact is, what you preach about many times is what begins to manifest the most. And I grew up hearing a lot of sin preaching, and I realized something. Being afraid of sin, being afraid of judgment, being afraid of hell will never keep someone a Christian. You can do all of your heaven's gates and hell's flames and and all those things you want to do, all you want, I'm not against those things. But all, if you make someone afraid and they come to Jesus out of fear, that's not the motivating spirit that keeps one saved anyway. So that's why someone will come to church scared to death. Oh, my Lord, I'm going to hell. And they go up and say a prayer. But then five minutes later, they're, they're you know, well, five days later, they're back out doing all the same stuff. Because until you fall in love with the, with the King of kings and Lord, until you allow his grace to wash you and you realize, man, I'm in love with her. Until it's love and not fear is your motivation then all you have is a religious experience, not the kingdom anyway. But 
I would be remiss to not set, to not explain to you at times how sin impacts your life. Because as a believer, sin can derail you. It can, it can be destructive, a destructive force in your life. And the truth is, our modern day churches, because we want to present a gospel of convenience and a gospel that's easy, uh, the gospel that most of the people, even that, that many, many people are preaching to this morning all around America, is not the gospel of the scripture. It's a gospel of, of the American church experience whereby we present a, a Christianity that does not take any kind of input whatsoever. It's a Christianity that makes, you know, makes it all about us and not about him. And it's a Christianity that's so drunk on grace that we preach grace the wrong way. Now, don't get me wrong. I was born and raised an old school Pentecostal. I needed the grace message. But anybody younger than me in this culture that's grow up in an American church system now, you don't need another grace sermon. We don't have any sermons anymore preaching about holiness, sanctification, about what it is to, to live our lives according to the word of God. That's, that's too hard for people. That don't grow churches. So we, we spoon feed people a candy cane Jesus to give them what they want to make our churches get bigger. So we present a gospel of a Jesus with no sacrifice. Come to Jesus as you are, it's fine. He's good with you. He loves you as you are. He doesn't require any kind of change. That's not what the word of God teaches. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the fact is God does love you who, for who you are. He loves you how you are. He loves you in the middle of your mess, but it doesn't mean your mess isn't still killing you. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not popular. Some of y'all look at me like you're mad now. It's okay. The fact is, the problem with the church that I grew up in was we didn't effectively teach the scripture I just read. Because we were taught to focus on the symptom and the fruit and not the root. So, for example, if you struggled with, uh, with getting high, they'd preach about you doing your drugs. If you was a fornicator, they'd talk about your fornication. And they, whatever it is you did, you were a liar, or you were whatever, you were a thief. Or they focused on the sin, and they love to beat you down for the sin, but beating someone down for the sin doesn't fix the problem. Every single sin that you could possibly think of comes from one of three places. These three places I just read to you, that's where your issue is. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. That's where your Jacob is hiding. And I'm going to explain them to you over the next 10 minutes to make my time. And I hopefully you can locate yourself in one of those, or maybe all three of those, so that we can deal with the, with the trickster in us. Are you ready? What does the word of God mean when it talks about the lust of the flesh? Write this down. The lust of the flesh is the desire for pleasure. It is the temptation to feel good. I want to feel, feels good. Yeah. yeah. I want to feel good. And I'm going to do me. No matter what it takes. I will do what brings me pleasure because I just want some relief. That's why you can't judge someone who may run to one thing for relief that you think is wrong when you have your own proclivities. Well, I deal with, I can't believe you do this, but you got your own stuff that you do to make you feel good. Yeah, some people even use religion as an escape in the wrong way. There are a lot of people that's churchy and religious but don't know Jesus. They can dance and buck and shout and run and spin and roll over and flip and do a shout and do a shandai and do all that and cuss you out in the parking lot. Being good at church, I, I got even got a witness over on this side. That's what I'm talking about. Let the Lord use you. Well, I go to church, I do what I, I'm about to go to McDonald's, I'm not going to turn into a McNugget. You can go to church all you want to. Going to Taco Bell won't make you a chalupa. Going to church will not make you right, won't make you a Christian. Christians go to church, but so does the devil all the time. It's okay. 
That's why you can't be frustrated and aggravated, whatever, because you found out your neighbor on your row is a human being. You go to work 40 hours a week with people trying to steal your job, talk about you, steal your man, do all kinds of stuff, want your promotion, and won't sit in church for 40 minutes You beside somebody you found out was just like you, a human. Whew, it's tight up in here this morning. I'm a, next week I'm going to preach the lollipop kids or something. It's going to be real, real, I got to balance. It'll be real soft next week. You judge the weed smoker or fornicator, but you gossip. Which at least they're destroying themselves, not someone else. There are too many Christians who are killing themselves literally and spiritually because they want what they want regardless of the cost. And if this church is going to preach in such a way that it's going to call me out on my mess, then I'm out. I'll find me somewhere else. I'll go where I can just get what I want. God loves me just how I am. And that's my man. I know God told me. He gave me a word. Don't matter he's been married 10 years. He made a mistake. Y'all laughing at me, but stuff comes to my mind. It's typically things I've dealt with before. Or I've seen. I'll find the church that lets me do me. Listen, don't fall for the trap of self-satisfaction. Don't fall for the trap. Listen, you might think this or that's going to make you feel good, but it's a trap. Do, don't chase things that are destroying your destiny. It's a temptation of passion to feel good. And it's amazing how a lot of sin always overpromises and underdelivers. That's why you always want to do it more after. Not right after if you're a Christian. Because if you're a Christian and you love Jesus, when you sin really good, you get real sanctified after. Like, Lord, Lord, I will never do that again. There's way too much agreement in this church right now. Y'all haven't been saying amen or nothing. I got there. I got all kinds of amens. You're right. Uh-huh. Jeez, man, I feel like we've got the mass deliverance up in here. Number two, write this down, the lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes is the desire to have. This one isn't about passion, it's about possessions. I need what I need and I want what I want. And even when I get it, I'm never satisfied because I want more. More money, more possessions, more positions. More church members, more, 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 more. And if I have to mislead my own father to get what I want, I'll do it. I'll dress up like someone else if I have to because, you know what, I'll do whatever I got to do to manipulate a situation or manipulate a system to get what I want. I don't care about your heart. I want more. I will use you. I'll trick you. I'll fight you. I'll lie to you all for more. It's a trap, Jacob. It's a trap. We got to get this stuff out of us. Satan himself had power, but it wasn't enough. Your life doesn't consist in the abundance of things, especially the ones that we got illegally. It's in him. Don't fall for the trap. And the last one, and I'm done. The pride of life. I have been able to locate myself or areas of weakness in my life in all three of these areas in different seasons, sometimes all at the same time. Fighting my Jacob. Fighting the hidden trickster in me that's trying to sabotage my future. But there's been no greater fight in my life than number three. The pride of life is ultimately the desire for position. It is the temptation to be. One's about passion. One's about possessions. But this one is about position. It's a temptation to be liked, to be seen, to be known. I want status. 
I want people to know I'm a somebody. When what we really want is to be worshipped. Because there's something on the inside of us. We're made in the image of God. So because we're made in the image of God, there is this, this innate desire at times to be worshipped. But we don't, we don't call it that because that would be too in our face. So we say things like, I, I want to be admired. I really want to just make a difference. I want to be famous one day. I know that I'm important. But why? Why is it? You see, all three of these things can stem from, from things the enemy even tried to do in you before you knew he was working. When God finally brought me to my greatest moment and season of Jacob, which I'm just now really coming out of, I've been in it three years and most of y'all don't know. I haven't, I've been in hell for three years, fighting, wrestling, quitting, not quitting, battling, sick. Not sick, going through, fighting, smiling, hallelujah, praise the Lord, I, I will preach and be fighting. And finally, even in the last month, I can see some ways that God brought me to a place to the end of myself and broke me. And I was like, okay, I'm, I, I'm ready to, I'm like, what do you want? Ready to fight. Now listen, real quick, before you are too quick to amen me, Know that this is something that you never want to go through, but it's something that's available to all of us. Seasons of real warfare. When I was a child, I remember a time in a church service where after a church service, I heard some people gossiping about my father. I was just a kid. About that. I'm going to use the word so any of y'all can't handle it. Close your ears. The bastard of a son. I heard someone with the most venomous spirit. It's a Pentecostal person, too. Talk about how my dad was sending people straight to hell because you know he's been divorced before. That kid should have never even been born. You don't know what happens to someone when they're seven and they hear something like that. You don't, your little mind can't process the seed that the enemy's sown in your life. And I can also take you to a time in my life where all I wanted was some of my half-siblings, especially my oldest brother, just to accept me. I remember one time he came for Christmas, and I can, I can take you to the spot in my parents' house where I was standing, listen to him try to talk to my dad, where I just wanted attention, and I was doing everything just to get him to notice me, and he turned and looked at me and was like, man, get away. I can also take you to a spot where another one of my siblings, when they were walking in when I was just a kid, all I wanted was them to acknowledge me, and they just walked past. And I just remember never feeling like I was good enough. I didn't understand why. But well, see, the enemy had sown something in me I didn't know. And for years, that thing grew. Where even though I was all trying to show confidence, and I trust in God, and I believe in Him, and all this is true, and I want to show confidence on the inside, I don't feel like anyone notices. Do you see me? So it started to bring competition in my life. Or even amongst my own spiritual brothers, I was always trying to prove something. Because I wanted someone to know I matter. I'm not just a little nobody from nowhere born in the backwoods of West Virginia somewhere. Not realizing that my Jacob was working in me. Not, realize, not realizing that I, was, I didn't even see my Heavenly Father appropriately. Because when I thought about myself, all I saw was what I wasn't. I, the words that were spoken, those things, grip your heart. No one asks to be molested when they're seven. No one asks to have parents that have a problem with the, each other and walk out when you're nine and you don't know why and you hear the fights and whatever and a parent unintentionally just angry says something to you that makes you think that you are the problem or you aren't wanted. When really it's down. And I'm not bringing condemnation to anybody. This is life. But the enemy many times will sow something into you and you didn't even know why. You didn't ask for that to happen to you. Those things 
the Spirit moves into one of your three areas. He starts to cultivate that pain in your life. And the Jacob starts growing. Where when you are grown and you're angry and life's hit you and you're alone and you're broken and you're frustrated and you don't know what's going on, finally God says, it's about time for me to deal with those things that are there that they didn't even know how they got there. And he goes, what is your name? Who are you? I know who you are, but I need you to admit it, Jacob. I need you to admit it before me. I need you to wrestle with me. I need you to show me that you're sick and tired of the trick in you. I want you to show me that you're sick and tired of the trickster, that you're sick and tired of what's happened to you. You're sick and tired of the brokenness. You're sick and tired of not. You're sick and tired of trying to make all this on your own. You're sick and tired of trying to show up and be the one and show out and be awesome. I didn't call you to be anything but obedient. That's all I want is for you to love me and listen to me. Let me rename you. And what, one of the ways you know you've been renamed is you start to walk different. People recognize someone that's been renamed. That's why you can't judge my limb. Because you don't know what I went through to get touched to get it. You see my limp, but you, you see the glory, but you don't know the story. You, you, you see a finished product. You see someone that's made it. You see someone that's come through. You see someone that's walking out on the other side, but you don't know how I had to wrestle in the midnight hour when no one was around. Where's my dad? Where's my mom? Where's my cousin? Where's my wife? Where's my, where's the, it's nobody but you and the angel. You better wrestle. You better fight, Jacob. You better fight that. You better fight. You better fight. You better fight. My prayer for you this morning is that God awakens you to everything in your life that's keeping you from being Israel. You're Israel. You're not Jacob. You got to admit where you've been, admit who you are, admit what's going on, admit what people have named you, and get, uh uh, God. Okay, what do you, who do you, who do you say that I am? Oh, and when he changes your name. He'll change your name right in front of the people that thought they named you to begin with. But see, the thing is, when he does it and you know it's him, you won't even feel, you won't feel proud in an arrogant way about it. You'll be humbled by it. I so some people say, oh, I, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it in the face of all of my haters. I'm going to make it in the face of all of my Okay, good. Good for you. Praise the Lord. I'll give you a clap. I ain't even worried about that. I'm going to have haters whether I'm doing good or bad. Some people in church shouting over haters don't even have a hater. They're imaginary. That's a ma- hating for what? You've been out the house three days this week. What you done to have a hater? Keyboard haters. Who cares? Facebook gangsters. Who cares? Are you going to let God deal with you and change your name? He loves you. And the thing is with him, he knows the truth. You can't hide it. He, he's not shocked. He's not surprised. He's just waiting. And he's saying, let me deal with it. I'll, I'll change your name. I'll fix it. I'll turn it around. I'll heal things that people thought would never be healed. But the difference between when it's God doing it and when it's you thinking you got over is every time you think about the goodness of Jesus. That's why you can't begrudge somebody sitting in the presence of God or in a moment like this when you look over and and whether they're 8 or 88, whether they're male or female, and you see that little tear start to trickle down the side of their eye. Don't even guess why. Just know that somewhere inside they're just saying, I'm thankful. So, so there's that, that tear that, that's coming out, that's a Jacob being dealt with. That's a, that's a you know what, anything that God really is going to do in my life is going to be him and not me. And he finally has you to the place where he wants you. He has you to the place where he can elevate you. This is, some of you, the reason God hasn't been able to elevate you the way he wants is because he loves you too much to give you what he's shown you because it would kill you because you can't have act decent when you don't have nothing. He gives you everything he'll give you. You lose your own, own mind. Let's stand and pray because I went almost 10 minutes over now. Some of you have to melt down. I'm at 45 minutes pushing 50. Jesus, we honor you above all things. We just thank you and we give you praise. We bless your name. We worship you. We glorify you. 
we honor you in this place. Show us our Jacob moments. Remove the trickster from our hearts and lives. Some in this place have battled so hard against things they didn't even know where it came from. They didn't even ask for it. Someone else named them. Something else attached itself to them. But God, you're able to break it. And so, Father, we just declare it in Jesus' name. God, we thank you that you're more than enough. We repent for the times we've tried to do things in our own strength and not in yours. We repent for the times, God, it was about us and not about you. And, Lord, we ask that you would help us surrender everything before you. And in this season, we refuse to let you go until we become everything you've called us to be. We just worship you in this place. If you're in this place as Lord, and you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, or if you're in this place and you feel like you feel the Spirit of God dealing with your heart this morning to deal with that Jacob you've been wrestling with while no one's looking around what I'd like for you to do just as an act of faith is lift a hand so I can see you lift a hand so I can see you just as an act of faith because what's going to happen is we're going to pray together amen you can put your hands down I'm going to pray a prayer before I bless you guys on the way out I'm going to pray and then here's what we're going to do this morning I want to pray I would like for us to pray together uh, I'd like for you actually to repeat this prayer after me in just a minute. After we're done, I'm going to bless you. And then I just have a, um, I have a, just two minutes to share something with any, any leader that maybe missed a quick meeting we had the other night. Um, just quick housekeeping thing. Two minutes of when I'm done praying. If you would, everyone just that, that wants to hear or miss this past week, just gather in this central section real quick. We'll have a quick meeting and we'll be done, but that's for anyone that missed. It'll, it'll be quick, I promise. Less meetings and more actions, how I function. I just want to be transparent with some things. But let's pray this morning. If you're in this place and you raise your hand, just pray this with me this morning. and. and Anyone else that would like to join in and pray this with me as well, please do so to encourage those around you that lifted their hand. Just say this, say, Father God, I'm here this morning because I recognize my need for you to be Lord in my life. King Jesus, I believe that you gave your life for me so that I could have a relationship with the Heavenly Father. And I ask that your Holy Spirit would invade my life. I believe that you died and rose again for me. I accept you by faith. I'm asking this morning that you change my name. Help me deal with the areas in my life that need your grace, that need your presence, that need your power. I receive your love, your forgiveness, and breakthrough in my life. In Jesus' name.